um, their he headphones on. Thank you for spending the beginning of the afternoon with us. And uh, we will start in a few minutes as soon as Mariti Ashak and um, uh, Erika Mann uh, arrive, which should be soon. So I hope Friday could be anybody on it. Friday or Saturday. Probably Saturday is better. But yes, I'm waiting for, for Erika, but I'm not sure I will. So we're, we're making a, a test uh, now. <laughs> Can you all? Um, yeah? Is it? Excellent. This is good. So we're still waiting just for, thank you, uh, Fouad. Oh, can, you, can you put it near Vint? So that Vint has the ladies with him. So, in order to be able to say that we have started on time, which is not exactly true at two or three minutes, but it is too exciting to be able to say it. <laughs> um, thank you so much for uh, having come for this workshop. All the, more, all the more so that it has been moved and I end up discovering that it is actually increasing its participation because otherwise people would have been in the, uh, in the main session. In a nutshell, as you know, uh, this is a, a workshop that is organized by the Internet and Jurisdiction Project, which is an initiative that uh, was launched in January this year. And as the panel behind me, the kakemono behind me, says it's a multi-stakeholder dialogue process. You've been sufficiently inundated with those brochures for me not to have to present uh, the initiative itself. If you need any information about it, 
www.internetjurisdiction.net and you will get everything you, uh, you need. The thing I want to highlight, and it was clearly something that emerged from the uh, session yesterday, which was on frameworks for online platforms, is the fact that this project is testing new modes of interaction among players. And I don't have to explain to you, most of you are confronted with this every day. How do you organize a global dialogue that is inclusive, not too costly, allows for face-to-face -face meetings, and is spread all around the world among all categories of stakeholders. So as everybody, we are trying to invent as we walk, and we have held during the year a certain number of meetings, some private, some public, and we had decided, we had decided from the onset that the IGF in Baku would be the first time where we would come really publicly to explain what the idea was, how much progress has been made, and what we intend to do in the coming year. The main objective of this um, project is to build upon a shared concern. Erica. I'm here. Wonderful. You just obey that I have to run out of Yeah, room. yes. Um, is to build upon one element. No actor that I have encountered, or Paul who was working with me, uh, has encountered in, the, uh, in this year has disputed the fact that there is a problem with jurisdictions and the internet. We are all confronted with this. Government, civil society, private sector, technical community, international organizations have a problem grappling with, with this. And so the objective of this exercise is not only to allow people to talk to one another, but also to try to frame the problem in a way that makes it more manageable try to get what we call, uh, and I give here credit to an old friend, Art Rayleigh from Cisco, uh, who gave this expression to me in the first IGF in Athens, uh, sorry, in the second one in Rio. The goal is to sh build a shared vernacular, like we use the same words and mean the same things behind the same words, which is not always easy. And so this is an annual opportunity to, to take stock. And this particular workshop is introducing, a, I hope, a bit provocative question, which is what is the geography of cyberspace? And interestingly enough, geography is, of course, connected to physical topography, mountains, rivers, lakes, whatever. But we usually understand under geography, political geography. And political geography means territories, frontiers, and sovereign responsibilities. Without getting into too much detail, this is the international system that we've been using since its early birth in 1648 in the uh, Treaty of Westphalia and the following. This system is based on the clear separation of sovereignties. Separation physically, frontiers, sometimes with thousands or millions of dead, have been determined to precisely say Sovereignty on this side and sovereignty on that side are separate and there is no interference normally in the affairs of another uh, country. The problem is that with the internet, the frontiers are probably not that clear, that they're probably not exactly in the place where they are in the physical world, and that uh, in addition, there are overlaps. This is what we want to explore today, and in particular, see in what way the jurisdictional map of cyberspace, the jurisdictional geography of cyberspace, is different or not from the traditional political geography. To do this, we'll split in two, in two parts. And the first part, I will just ask one question to each of the panelists. I will ask them to introduce themselves when they speak for the first time. And I will start with Vincerf uh, first and ask him the following question. Historically, the internet has been conceived as borderless or non-geography based. Is this still valid today? And in particular, one concrete question, was the introduction of the country code top level domains a first re-territorialization of the internet or not? So thank and you tell very us who much. you are. <laughs> 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 
Thank you very much, Bertrand. Uh, I'm Vince Cerf. I guess you already said that. Um, I'm Google's uh, chief internet evangelist. So let me start with a small bit of history. Uh, when the internet was first designed, uh, it was very deliberately chosen not to use any kind of country coding for the address space, the numeric address space. And the reason that we chose not to have any country codes is that we believe that topology was the key element in Internet's architecture. It was the interconnection of networks. And topology has to do with the relationship between those networks and how they were interconnected. You've all seen big complex diagrams showing how this topology works and how it looks. And what is Im important about this is that the topology interpenetrates the physical space. A logical network, an autonomous system, can be, uh, can uh, span over all kinds of national boundaries, especially the large global networks may have presence in many, many different countries. Uh, there was also, um, in the back of my mind, a kind of scenario that uh, mitigated against using uh, country codes for address structure. I was thinking, remember, the military was uh, sponsoring the design of the system. And I had this uh, momentary uh, thought that if country A was planning to invade country B in two weeks and uh, realized it was going to need address space in order to run its command and control system after it had crossed into the border, can you imagine going to country B saying, uh, uh, excuse me, we're planning to invade in two weeks and we need some address space in order to run our command and control system? That didn't sound like a very uh, plausible uh, design, so we stuck with the topological uh, choice. It turned out uh, that even with the IP version 6 address structure with the larger 128-bit addresses, we're still using purely topological ways of identifying uh, the interconnection of uh, and identifying each of the autonomous systems. When the domain name system was originally put together, uh, in fact, before it was put together, we just had little strings ident identifying the name of an institution. So UCLA or MIT or uh, Carnegie Mellon was the name of the destination. And if your mailbox would be, you know, in my case, it was surf at USC-ISI. Uh, clearly, that wasn't going to work as the system was expanding. And so in the mid-1980s, uh, it was uh, the domain name system was designed as a, an expandable system. In that point, John Postel uh, chose, and uh, Paul Macapetras chose, uh, seven generic top-level le domains just to have a, a means for um, delegating responsibility for managing the registration process instead of having one person, John Postel, do it. Mm -hmm. And so they had .com and .net, .org, .mil, and uh, .gov, and so on, .int for international. But not long after, and I'm not sure I remember which year, but it wasn't very long after the introduction of those um, generic top-level domains that it was uh, realized that countries might want to have some kind of nomenclature, some presence in this name space. Now, please distinguish name and address. The countries were interested in having presence in the name space of domain names. Keep in mind that the domain names are at a level of abstraction above the IP address space. There's a binding between them, but they are separate and distinct. So one very important observation is that these namespaces do not have to be identical in their structure, and they are not. So uh, this first introduction of uh, the, t the country code TLDs uh, was the first instance of recognizing that some of the signposts in the domain name space wanted to be bound to geographically recognizable entities, countries. Uh, without going into a whole lot of other detail, John didn't want to be the decision maker to decide what's a country, who is a country. So he went, eventually found the uh, United Nations two-letter designations for uh, countries and areas of economic interest maintained by the German uh, Institute for Standards as uh, ISO 3166-1. And so he said, if it's in there, it's okay to use that uh, two-country code, two-letter country code. If it isn't in there, don't use it. 
there are anomalies anyway, but I'll, you know, like .uk versus .gb, but let me set that aside for now. Uh, so that's the basic uh, thing. It was the first instance, and what is peculiar, let me finish uh, with this one other observation. What has happened in, as these two notions of address and name were introduced is the uh, mappings going from the IP addresses to geographic locations became a popular pastime. Companies like Google and others use that to decide that if the IP address appears to be from a a, uh, a network which is located in you know, France, let's say, then we will bring up the google.fr page. Some people are upset about that because they say, just because I happen to be in France right now uh, doesn't necessarily mean that I wanted to go and look at the google.fr page. And so there's arm wrestling over that. But that's where we are. Thank you very much, Vint. Um, if I understand correctly, the cross-border nature of the uh, system was a feature, not a bug. <laughs> Absolutely. And uh, I like the notion that the domain system was a matter of delegating responsibility to address basically a scalability problem. And I wonder, and we can talk about that in the second part, whether there's a parallel here with the notion of subsidiarity in uh, many legal systems, like there are layers of responsibility. The, fin the final element is, um, without getting into the uh, IP and CC couplage, um, you mentioned the levels of uh, abstraction and the notion that the Internet is based on a layered uh, architecture. Uh, we will see in the course of this session that in many cases we are confronted with layers of jurisdictions, in addition, that do not necessarily map the layers of, of the... Um, let me turn to my, to my right to uh, Eric Amann, uh, who was a fellow uh, ICANN board member, but also um, at Facebook. And I want to ask her a question which is a sort of metaphor, and it should not necessarily be taken as more than a metaphor, but it helps frame the discussion. Uh, I've used the metaphor often that platforms like Facebook, irrespective of the size of their um, uh, members, the number of their members, uh, are cross-border spaces that are in certain way digital territories and the terms of service of those platforms are in a certain way the law of the digital territory as long as you are as a user on the server of Facebook or YouTube and so on. How true is this analogy and is it helpful in the debate? I think, Bertrand, it is, um, it is a very helpful um, uh, metaphor. I mean, when you look at Facebook, which is uh, interesting um, um, to look at this, like, like for many other social service um, uh, companies, when you look at it, I mean, we have one billion uh, users. Uh, the basic principle and philosophy is that we want, that users want to share information. They want to share information, of course, locally. They want to share it nationally and I want to share it globally. To some degree, we are all global citizens nowadays. We still are bound uh, by our national environment, but you still, and on the other side, we are global citizens. Now the basic philosophy for, for Facebook, like for Google, um, like for Twitter, is of course to connect people and to connect business. Now, connection nowadays is not bound any longer by national boundaries or even by local boundaries. So, and, and if this is, when you look at the, uh, at the way our system functions, and, and as rightly as Bertrand said, we are a, kind, uh, we are a platform uh, built system. So to some degree, of course, the international, uh, there, there are no international boundaries. On certain companies, of course, which use our platform, they, of course, experience national boundaries. Uh, for example, when you look at Spotify or other services which have to license intellectual property rights agreements for delivering music, um, in many countries like in the European Union, for example, they have to sign um, a license agreement. So we always will have a kind, depending, uh, you know, uh, what kind of service is delivered, we will always have national, we will always experience to some degree national boundaries but we should never forget that the principle of international um, zero uh, boundaries is relevant for the Internet, because otherwise the whole concept of the Internet will collapse. Now, sometimes we think, I think, that um, this is completely new, and I like to remind us all that the principle of what I call common spaces, 
of the law of common spaces is not new. When you look back in the history of technology development, um, we experienced this many times when the steam involved and the concept of time was developed. A time was not a concept which existed um, uh, before, at least on an international scale. It, and it existed on a more nationalized or local scale, but not on the international scale. The same is true for maritime law. The same is true for space law. So all of this, what I call the law of common spaces, is not completely new. So I think it is, we should all remind us to look into the history um, and should not try to in, reinvent the law and, and the legal environment completely new because we suddenly experience that to some degree the concept of national sovereignty uh, is overlapping with the desire and with the need to have an international framework and to pre preserve the international framework on the internet. So I would remind us that renationalization is not a concept. It's not a concept because it will not just destroy the concept of the internet per se. It will destroy the sharing of information and the connecting of people, but it will destroy many business opportunities globally as well. So this is, I, I think, let's go back and let's understand better um, the, uh, the concept of the um, law of common spaces and let's not work with the concept of national law uh, without understanding the international implication. National law per se is not an, a useful meta metaphor for these framing regulatory uh, approaches in the uh, internet environment. Thank you. Um, you use the expression global citizens. What I find striking is that in our activities, we develop what could be uh, called multiple stakeholderships. You are users of certain platforms. We are citizens of a country. We are um, uh, in a certain marital status. We are uh, lovers of cars as opposed to uh, lovers of dogs. And all those activities, it can be uh, together, I agree. <laughs> um, the thing is, we used to be defined some sort of in terms of what are the rules applicable mainly by our citizenship because we were having activities mostly in our countries and exceptionally traveling. Interestingly enough, you mentioned communities and the fact that human communities are getting cross-border. If you look at a long-term historical time span, human communities have grown in size according to the modes of transportation and the modes of communication. Language transform was a, a, a remarkable invention that transformed the relationship between uh, communities allowed the uh, tribal system. Uh, all modes of transportation, I suppose that the invention of the wheel was as transformative as the invention of the airplane and so on. Each major step has required a reorganization of the rules for the coexistence of communities that are larger and larger and more and more diverse. And the challenge we have today is just another very big step in this long-term uh, tendency. Uh, finally, the law of common spaces is a wonderful transition to the question I intended to ask uh, Wolfgang, which is, um, no, I'm sorry, because actually I intended to go to Marichi first. <laughs> that will be come next. Um, Marie Cechak was an MEP uh, in the European Parliament from the Netherlands. There have been discussions, particularly in the previous uh, workshop we organized and other uh, sessions, numerous sessions actually in this uh, IGF, regarding the question of extraterritorial impact and extension of sovereignty, the Rora Directa case and, and others. Do we see both an increasing trend towards the extension of the sovereignty of actors on the territory of others, and at the same time, a sort of re, an attempt at re-territorialization, re-nationalization of the legal uh, frameworks. Thank you very much. Um, just a little disclaimer. Um, I'm a member of the European Parliament. I'm not a lawyer. Uh, and what I would like to do with you is to just think out loud. But these are not concepts that I'm 100% certain about, and it's just to, you know, reflect uh, my thinking about what I believe is going on. Um, 
And I think that there is um, a very important aspect of the impact of technologies, which is a redistribution of power, uh, mostly the empowerment of individuals, but also a redistribution between, let's say, governments and their uh, traditional and also constitutional responsibilities and the emerging powers or impact that internet services and corporate actors have um, in this online space. Uh, and I'm very interested, of course, in sort of the democratic aspects of governance, uh, also in the context of a multi-stakeholder uh, way of, of dealing with this, um, with this online space. Uh, and indeed, one of the main challenges, I think, is the, the role of lawmakers in this new space, where there is global access, uh, but there is still local jurisdiction. And of course, there are a number of overlapping uh, spheres for example, you know, as we know them traditionally in the context of international trade or international law or multilateral treaties uh, or de facto uh, overlaps. For example, if uh, somebody goes on holiday to a country, commits a crime, uh, where should they be tried? Uh, so a lot of what we're thinking about is not that different from concepts that we've seen before the Internet existed, but their application uh, and aspects of accountability and enforcement uh, are actually very new online. So let me just give you uh, a couple of examples. Uh, the most extreme one uh, when you're talking about re-territorialization uh, is that of, of the Islamic Republic of Iran, I believe at this moment, where there is an attempt by the government to actually really bring back the uh, uh, control over people when they, when they go online uh, to a sphere that is entirely controlled by the government of the Islamic Republic of Iran. And so the re-territorialization of the internet is probably most complete uh, in Iran. It's, it's not even part of the World Wide Web as such anymore, but it's really an intranet uh, where censorship, monitoring, uh, and centralization of information flows prevail. Um, I think in general though, uh, if we don't look at just the most extreme cases, we do observe uh, this notion of layers or several aspects of the questions we're dealing with pertaining to law, oversights, but also rights that users have, which can vary a great deal depending on what services they use in which country uh, and uh, under which jurisdiction they, they fall. Uh, and the same goes for aspects of power and impact. Uh, I think it would be fascinating to try to assess the, um, the impact of a company uh, like Google uh, in comparison to the size of a country. So how big of a country would Google be in terms of its impact on the global stage? You can, of course, assess economic impact, but I think you know, impact on, on the lives of people, their access to information uh, is another interesting um, question. And the interesting thing is that where national governments uh, used to have uh, a number of monopolies, increasingly they are merely, let's say, stakeholders uh, in a much uh, broader environment. Um, but there will continue to be a relationship between the online and the offline. Uh, there's always a basis that can be found in the offline environment, uh, also very practically in terms of the infrastructure that we use uh, for um, uh, internet services and the practi practical functioning uh, of the internet but also in terms of, for example, where internet services and companies are incorporated. Uh, that has a, has a real impact. Uh, but then, uh, after this incorporation, uh, the services reach beyond borders and, and information uh, flows. And if we think about what kind of a legal framework we need in order to meet this new uh, environment, uh, when we look at past attempts to build a global legal order, we see that this is only partially uh, succeeded and that also there we know a variety of, of uh, applications of law, agreements, um, etc. I believe it would be great to have a starting point in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Uh, I'm glad that it is accepted by many uh, that human rights are universal, but of course we know that there are also challenges and uh, there's also a challenge even if we agree that human rights should apply equally online as they do offline to see how they how this should be implemented. So if this is what we believe, how do we make that happen? Um, where uh, are these principles applied? And who oversees and protects people's human rights in this online sphere? 
Uh, and I believe that there is a huge role for both governments, but also certainly for uh, companies. And they are traditionally not uh, educated or held accountable in the same way uh, as governments are. Sometimes it fits their business model. Um, sometimes it doesn't. Uh, especially when companies are state-owned, uh, there's a very different kind of uh, uh, accountability to uh, the, s the shareholders in that sense. Or, for example, if we compare internet services to telecom operators or, or other intermediaries who actually also physically have to operate on the ground in third countries uh, where they uh, hire people, where they are bound by local laws and contracts, uh, this leads to a very different kind of... Uh, uh, set of responsibilities and operational uh, challenges. So perhaps uh, one way to kind of uh, get to a point of more agreement is to look at the context of, of multilateral organizations that we already know. Um, in the WTO, for example, there is the Information Technology Agreement, which could be updated to reflect on global digital market aspects, or for example, uh, could be uh, including rules on openness and access. Um, and if we look in the context of international law, uh, some people have suggested that maybe we need uh, new courts or sort of a virtual court of justice uh, in The Hague or something like that. Uh, but I think we would be um, uh, moving ahead uh, already if we ensure that Competence, uh, competencies of existing uh, international law mechanisms are also applied when relating to the online environment. So, for example, it is conceivable, but here my uh, lack of expertise in the international uh, legal field may, may be a challenge, but that the International Criminal Court could also function for disputes uh, when it pertains to cyber war, uh, whether it is uh, an attack from one state to another, or whether it is an attack from uh, a state to its citizens, such as uh, as we've seen in North Africa and the Middle East in a number of cases. In any case, holding individuals responsible there, uh, I think the ICC is an important platform. Uh, but then we may need a digital freedom protocol to the Rome Statute, for example. So we do have to uh, ensure that there is um, a mandate. <coughs> um, I'll say a few more words and then I'll stop because I know we're going to have uh, enough time for, uh, for a discussion. Um, a different aspect to all these layers of, of influence um, is that lawmakers do in fact increasingly have sort of global constituents. Uh, I noticed this as a lawmaker myself uh, or a policymaker. We were lobbied heavily um, on the European side to uh, to vote down ACTA, not only by European citizens and companies, but clearly also by a no number of American players, because the uh, Congress didn't have uh, a say in whether ACTA would be uh, ratified or not. And so we actually kind of became a people's representation for a number of stakeholders in the online sphere who at a decisive moment had something to say. And similarly, when uh, the SOPA and PIPA proposals were before the US Congress, uh, I decided to write a letter on behalf of uh, EU lawmakers and companies uh, protesting these kinds of proposals. And so again, uh, as I started out by saying, how do we ensure that fundamental democratic principles of representation and accountability uh, actually apply in this cross-border sphere and how do we consider uh, these global constituencies? Uh, I think these are fascinating questions. Um, the risks of ex extraterritorial uh, impact and power are real. On the other hand, we have to remember that this impact only becomes real when it is acknowledged and applied. So there can be a number of attempts to influence the online sphere uh, or the international sphere for that matter. Let me give you a completely different example. In Belgian law, uh, there's an, a possibility to try heads of state of third countries. So it was kind of a national attempt to have international accountability, for example, in the cases of war crimes. And so uh, I think an arrest warrant against Ariel Sharon was at one point um, uh, put instituted there because of, of this Belgian law. But of course, 
uh, it would be a different matter whether he would actually have been arrested on the basis of, of this Belgian law. Uh, similarly, there is an arrest warrant against um, Omar al-Bashir uh, of Sudan uh, under the International Criminal Court. However, uh, he has not thus far been arrested, even by countries where the Rome Statute uh, does apply. So, um, the expectation of extraterritorial impact, the de facto uh, extraterritorial impact, uh, are still concepts that are basically fought out uh, before courts and in the market space. Um, but I think lawmakers would, would be well off to play a more um, proactive role in ensuring that there is democratic oversight, that there is representation, uh, and that some of the fundamental principles that we uh, hold uh, dear uh, continue to apply online. Thank you very much. As I did in the previous interventions, I will pick uh, just a, a few words. The recurring word of overlapping multiplicity of layer, multiplicity of competence criteria is an ongoing leitmotiv in all those discussions. I'd like to pick on another one we can expand later on. But when we talk about redistribution of power, there are different situations. They can be zero-sum games and they can be non-zero-sum games. And one of the questions we'll explore further is when you have to deal with a common space, you can create value by co-managing this common resource in a way that is actually enhancing the well-being, the social and economic value, or you can get into a fight where one type of actor just tries to un unseat another one. And in that regard, we have not decided yet, or we have no way to know yet, whether the redistribution of power between and or among government, civil society, and private sector is going to be necessarily to the detriment of governments or to increase capacity of all actors to manage the problems that we have on this, on this, on this earth. But that's a larger issue. The other one I wanted to, uh, to, to, to pick is um, the different options that you have mentioned, be it the WTO or virtual court of justice, uh, there is a background mental framework that is still impregnated by the international organizations that are relatively pyramidal in, in, in that you have the large group of countries, 190, then you have a council that is uh, making the ongoing decisions and usually a secretary general that is at the top. The internet doesn't function like this, and the notion that issues can be distributed among large number of different entities that deal with them with the appropriate stakeholders is also an alternative model that is not necessarily pyramidal. That being said, I want to uh, turn now to uh, Wolfgang Kleinwächter, because fundamentally what was mentioned in the two interventions before lead to the direction of the management of common spaces. And instead of having sovereignty or sovereign territories where we painfully separate who has the jurisdiction, we're confronted with the question, which is different, who are the people who have responsibility, which is completely different because it is a joint management. And for those who are familiar with the work of the uh, Nobel Prize winner in economics of 2009, I think, Elinor Ostrom, there is a challenge in the comparison with the tool that is the common pool resources governance. And uh, I'd like to ask um, Wolfgang Kleinwächter to talk a little bit about this notion of common spaces. Uh, Erika mentioned the law of common spaces. And also a little bit about the um, work in the Council of Europe on the transboundary impact and responsibilities of state that is attached to the exercise of sovereignty. Thank you, Bertrand. My name is Wolfgang Kleinwächter. I'm a professor for internet policy and regulation at the University of Aarhus in Denmark. And I think it was Daniel Bell 50 years ago who argued that the nation state becomes too big for the local problems and too small for the global problems. And he sandwiched between, you know, the challenges coming from the ground and coming from the global things, and this has triggered a debate about the future of the nation state and the Westphalian system. You know, the experience now from the first 12 years in the 21st century is the nation state will not go away. We will have to live with the nation state at least in the 21st century, so it's difficult to make any forecast what the 22nd century bring. But, uh, you know, for the moment and for the next 50 years, we should accept that the nation state exists. 
And, then, and this brings us back to the system which has more or less worked and where we have a legal foundation. And the whole Westphalian system, which um, uh, uh, Bertrand introduced, is based on the national sovereignty of the nation state. And this is a concept which is introduced in the Charter of the United Nations. Um, cyberspace, as we have learned, and as Wind has uh, uh, introduced it also, you know, is you know a different space. And uh, you know, if you understand what our layered systems are, then you say, you know, it's not the same. It's something different. We have still difficulties to understand what exactly the differences are. In a conference recently in Budapest, when the British Foreign Minister William Hague proposed seven principles for internet governance. Uh, the Chinese uh, vice uh, minister replied and said, it's wonderful to discuss principles. Here are my five principles. And he said, the first principle is cyber sovereignty. And then he explained a little bit his understanding under cyber sovereignty. And uh, his definition was the extension of national sovereignty into cyberspace. Okay, you know, this was a very clear word. But now imagine the reality. If you have the real space with the 190 sovereignties, and then the cyberspace on the other layer, where then 190 national sovereignties meet in a common space. So this could create a lot of conflicts because the understanding how to exercise sovereignty is rather different from country to country. So if you have a border between the two countries, probably then you can fix some cross-border problems, but more or less, you know, each country is sovereign to do something on their own country. But if it goes into this common space, then you have a problem. And the only way out is, you know, to find a certain way of collaboration. Or uh, the alternative is that my sovereignty counts and you have to forget about your rights. So that means it's a permanent war than uh, what you can trigger in cyberspace. So it means the concept of collaborative sovereignty, of shared sovereignty, is the only way out if it comes to cyberspace, because n nobody can really say, okay, um, you know, I just extend my national sovereignty to the cyberspace and I occupy this. We know this from other arenas, in the field of environment, in the field of uh, the, the outer space and, 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 and law of sea convention and things like that. So we have some common spaces where also governments accept that their national sovereignty has certain limits. I think, you know, certainly it, it, it would, it, or this brings us to the no harm principle. I think in the Council of Europe working group, Alvana is sitting here in the room, we discussed all these various uh, dimensions of international law and came back that the, the so-called no harm principle is probably extremely important for this co exercise of collaborative sovereignty in the cyberspace. That means if I, you know, build a factory on the border to a neighboring country and I start to pollute the neighboring country. So I, I have the sovereign right to do this, but <laughs> then, you know, I have a conflict. I cannot do this. So that means I have to take into consideration the interests of my neighbor. So and to frame my, sovereign, my exercise of sovereign rights, you know, within this um, general accepted rules. And so it's the same in the Internet. If I do something, you know, in my home country, which uh, in the Internet, which affects the global internet and creates harm. This should be not allowed. So certainly, you know, I have sovereign rights to do this in my own country. So and we have different understanding, you know, what crimes are, content of information, privacy regulation. You have a lot of different things which are related to the internet. As long as you can restrict the effects of your sovereign decision to your territory, probably this is fine. But if it affects, you know, other citizens, outside of your territory, then you have to be very careful. I think what Mayette said was, was very important that we now move into a situation that our constituencies are far, far beyond uh, our national borders. She writes a letter to the U.S. Congress, you know, U.S. comp corporations lobby the European Parliament, you know, to, uh, to, to vote against uh, a treaty which was uh, uh, negotiated by governments. So all this brings, brings new constellation and we have not yet fully understood what does it mean? But one conclusion is certainly correct, that it needs a new understanding of the exercise of national sovereignty. Just the extension into cyberspace, it's not enough. 
So it means, uh, you know, to promote a concept of collaborative so uh, sovereignty, of shared sovereignty, and this is a very, very delicate point. And, you know, a, a, a final word uh, about this, um, you know, uh, power, uh, redistribution of power. I think we see a permanent shift of power, and we are in a transformation period where power is, and a power shift is always followed by power struggle. And then at the end of the day, by a redistribution of power. And we should not be afraid to, to talk about this because there are national interests involved, uh, in, involved, there are economic interests involved, there are a lot of other interests involved. And, and policy and, 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 and lawmaking means, you know, trying to find a balance of interest. I think if we bring transparency into interest, what's behind the motivation of governments, what is behind the motivation of uh, corporations, more transparency enables us to find let's say, the rough consensus on certain issues in, in this uh, common space. And I stop here, and probably we can continue the debate later. Thank you. Thank you, Wolfgang. <clears throat> in that regard, I just want to insert one, one notion. We consistently talk about cyberspace. In many cases, maybe we should be talking about cyberspaces, because there are many spaces in the Internet, uh, or on the Internet. Uh, there are private spaces. There are very public spaces, and even within platforms like Facebook, Twitter, and others, there are different spaces. And maybe in certain cases, the rules that apply to those spaces are different. If you take an analogy with the physical world, the rules that apply to uh, your behavior in your apartment, inside a shop, or in the street, are not exactly the same. And on the internet, there is no such thing as a unified cyberspace like the extra atmospheric uh, space. There are different spaces uh, in there. Uh, one thing I wanted to, uh, to mention, and I forgot, uh, regarding what Mariti was saying before, about the real risk of extraterritorial impact. There's a distinction that is useful to make, is that there are sometimes voluntary and perfectly intentional extraterritorial extensions of sovereignty, because it is a way to exercise uh, power. And there are also completely unintended um, uh, extraterritorial impact when a technical glitch in uh, the um, filtering of uh, something can lead to the filtering in another country as it happened as we saw last time in between India and Oman because of the peering arrangements. So I think it's important to distinguish the rules or the mechanisms we may apply to try to solve or remediate the unintended uh, impacts, which actually is in the recommendation of the Council of Europe of the obligation to cooperate to remediate or to prevent transboundary harm. The other case is harder because it is the matter of the limitation of sovereignty. Maritza, you wanted to make a, a brief comment and I go yeah, to Yeah, I just wanted to respond because I think this notion of voluntary versus involuntary uh, conceding of, of sovereignty is very important. But there is another aspect of this which is not only a matter of, uh, let's say, reciprocal agreements between nation states, but it's the de facto extraterritorial impact of, for example, companies. Yes, absolutely. And that is not such a, it, it can have de facto consequences which are actually anti-constitutional, for example, you know? So let me give you an example. So according to the terms of use of Twitter, people agree to um, be subject to, to those terms whenever they're using Twitter. Then a Dutch citizen uh, was using Twitter, who was then uh, being investigated in, in the WikiLeaks <coughs> case by the American um, Department of Justice. So the American Department of Justice asked for his private communications. Mm -hmm. um, and Twitter, because it's against its business model, uh, notified the people for, the, for whom this applied. However, couldn't stop this uh, warrant by the uh, Department of Justice, and so American law prevailed over uh, the wishes of this company. But it is questionable whether the same laws would apply for a Dutch citizen per se. But because he was using an American service, mm -hmm. uh, the American Department of Justice had this power. Now, if these data lead him to be a suspect, mm -hmm. there may be uh, an um, extradition yeah. claim on this citizen. And all these kinds of phenomena uh, directly undermine core responsibilities of the nation state, which is to protect so their citizens. 
Uh, and this is a, a matter in an individual case, such as I, I mentioned, but also in collective sense, like when we're talking about uh, cyber defense or, mm. or cyber crime, you know, that is, I think, where the real tension in this debate comes in, not where countries agree to give up sovereignty, but where they Absolutely. don't agree. Thank you. I will um, turn to the last uh, panelist before opening the, uh, the discussion. Um, Vivek, you come from India, which is a country in itself of more than one billion people that has many states, as it is a federal state, and therefore a lot of subsidiarity rules and overlaps of different jurisdictions. And in addition, an extremely um, differentiated uh, society with a lot of religious, ethnic, uh, and social differences. Is this a sort of microcosm of the global world? And how do people at the national level inside India handle those challenges that we're discussing for the global uh, space? Well, uh, thank you, Bertrand. Just to give the stats, this claim it's 5,000 year old civilization, 800 languages spoken, 2,000 dialects exist without written scripts, 22 official languages you can see in every Indian currency, 29 states, 6 union territories, it's a vast land with 1.2 billion, and one, one way we can beat China is in population in a few years. So how this many, is how many states for those who have 29 states and we have got uh, six union territories. We have the common law British system, and then we have Portuguese law. We have the French law. There are people who work for the French president sitting in Pondicherry. Yeah. And then so you have uh, other northeastern side tribal and customary law. So I would say that it's certainly it's more than a microcosm in one sense, <laughs> or it's called as a subcontinent. And I always said that uh, being Indian prime minister for one year, it's a very good experience to manage any other nation state. So given all this, let me talk about uh, drawing experience in terms of internet, what you're looking. Of course, there's one difference, as you said, that the word sovereignty, which means there is a state. And then we are not having something in the cyberspace to equate. But when I really look at uh, how do these uh, differences are managed, probably a very conscious citizen will tell it's not managed properly. <coughs> and people will tell that, uh, you know, it's so much of, Difference, uh, differences and infighting. But many may not know the concept of India itself is from the British period. Prior to that, it is 500 kingdoms which were there and many were lively existing, taking doles during the British time, which was abolished later in 1947. So if I look at the run-up of 500 kingdoms to 22 states, I consider that they have managed it better than what would have been 500 kingdoms or 500 cyber sovereignties you would have had, you know, if you had, there is no country like India. A bit, a bit like Germany now versus uh, what it was yeah. in 1648. 1648, I would say that uh, this is the uh, Westphalia 2.0 version, <laughs> what I would call it in terms of India. So now the question what I say is that, for example, uh, one way of managing this or the tension points, which is interesting from a nation state versus uh, the other one which, uh, which I was, uh, uh, what you call, looking at in you know, Wolfgang's statement was that we have a center and state. The federalism is not in like in other countries, the territorial. It is also with linguistic, you know, basis. So we read, uh, we read designated states on based on language, which is one of the fundamental part, even though there is a broad pan-Indian cultural ethos, there's a strong linguistic affinity, there is a differentiation. So the concept of unity in diversity, that's a, that is the managing concept. So we are not talking about flattening or you know, uh, you know, making it equal. Unity in diversity is always tricky. It's always tricky, but that is the only way to go because, as I said, that the number of nation states could multiply within, from India. There are many who would like to get out if it is not managed properly. So the whole question, for example, the devolution of power between the center and state is a good example. If you really look at, uh, if you look at internet space as a center and others as state, for uh, uh, he said that states will not go. In my opinion, states will multiply. It's not the question of coming down, it's going to multiply. That's my understanding from 1950 to now. So in that space, if I look at the center state model, for example, the um, external security, and then the currency, and then uh, the foreign relation. This seems to be the bulwark of the center. In fact, center had many powers. 
Now, all the tension between the center and states, if I have to draw a lesson, is about devolution of power to the states. And they manage their own affairs because they have then identity, sub-identity, I call it, or sub-nationalist identity within India. So this is one of the important things. Probably if you consider India is in that context, not from development index, many other failures. If you really look at it's still a democratic country in terms of certain voices, at least it's heard periodically once in five years, at least people can be thrown out and people can be brought power. It's the biggest democracy, if not the oldest. So if you really look at it, one of the important part is trying again again coming to the value system that is unity in diversity, not trying to flatten it. The moment attempts were being made, any time to flatten it could only result in bigger movements. In fact, at the time of Indian independence, there are few states, especially in the southern states, they wanted a South India Republic. They were not part. They said it's only a devolution of power from the British to the elite of the Indian, you know, elite class. So they said they had no chance. But over a period of time, if you take up polling, in terms you want a secession and go out, the chances would be very less. Of course, some parts still there are, you know, what you call it, they have not handled it politically and diplomatically correct. There are a few parts like in the uh, northern parts of India or so, the northeastern parts of India. But the majority could feel that they are part of something which there is a common benefit and also they have their identity. So this is, in my opinion, uh, I would like to close as a crucial thing, the subject matter what we are really dealing of cyberspace and the real space, which I thought I'll come back in your next round to a little more talk about the virtual and real space, how to cartograph this. So in that context, I feel that in our excitement and over enthusiasm, in terms of the great benefits of cyberspace, etc., it could go reverse. And history has time and again proven this. And so that is a big lesson we have to keep in. If Since you said about India, I have a lot of Indian friends who might be bored if I'm going to talk more about India. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. You just highlighted how more uh, difficult the problem is than the one I expected at first. Um, I noted the, uh, the expression common benefit uh, as an illustration of the interest of establishing common rules. If the actors get together to establish common rules, this is a common benefit. However, the danger of this technological and communication revolution to produce as much transitional pain as the previous communications revolution like the printing press or the telegraph and the uh, and radio and television is, is still there. Uh, we'll come to that again later, but we are advancing in time. I understand that there is a question at remote participation, which will be a good start for the, uh, the opening up of questions. We have already consumed almost an hour, like 40, uh, 55 minutes. Uh, I would like to open the, the floor because there are many people in this room who have as much capacity to contribute to this discussion and there's no way we will exhaust this topic. But let's start with uh, remote participation and maybe make more statements uh, or brief questions so that we can go forward on the discussion. Paul. Yes, um, there's one question from Edmund Chang <coughs> and he says, when he hears about the concept of geography of the internet, he feels that in order to understand what we are really talking about, it perhaps is needed that we first understand the elements, the form and the landscape of the internet, mm -hmm. and not just the physical jurisdictional concepts. And what he means with this is that um, he wants to know what are the equivalent of mountains or oceans or land on the internet before jumping to countries or sovereignties. So basically the notion of what is the topography before the political geography. Um, we can keep that issue to explore further in terms of the physical interconnection, the routing system and that sort of thing. I had at least three people. Come here. Whoops. I stopped for the moment. I have Cornelia, this person, uh, you, you, you. No, I'm done. Go ahead. We have five. Uh, I'm not getting you. Yeah. Okay, wonderful. Cornelia Kutter from Microsoft. Um, I want to make a, a legal comment. I'm a lawyer, so it's boring. I'm sorry for that. Um, in, in, in Europe, I think we, uh, first of all, I would like to make a distinction between applicable law and jurisdiction. So which law applies and afterwards, where do you go to court? And um, 
it is it is um, most laws uh, in in the different areas of policy privacy defamation freedom of expression consumer protection IP rights which are mentioned here have already rules on applicable law and they also follow rules uh, where you go to court if there is a conflict um, and just to give you an interesting example from the European Union in e-commerce we followed the the applicable law rule country of origin principle uh, consumer protection laws are exempted from it, so is intellectual property law. In the data privacy regulation, now they think about the c country of origin principle, which is not yet the case. In consumer protection law, however, you follow the, the consumer residence law. So we, even within a, a, a certain space, in, uh, in, in, in a certain region, you have different different rules that apply and they are not coherent. However, there is one thing which would help and does help not only to talk about the applicable law jurisdiction but about the harmonization of the applicable law because that helps at the end of the day in international fora to come to agreements as long as the, the applicable law, the, 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 the content of the regulation is not harmonized, it will be much harder to actually come to a conclusion at, at, at this international level on the applicable law and the jurisdiction. When the laws come closer to each other, the, 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 common, the common ground is, is, is more harmonized. You will have easier time to get to, a harmon uh, to, to, to conclusions in, in that space. And can you, can you please make comments short? I no, not yet. Yeah. yeah. Um, this better. My name is Subhi Chaturvedi and I teach communication and new media and run a foundation called Media for Change. I'll make this very brief. Uh, we've had a very, very interesting conversation and I didn't almost make it here. There are two comments here. One, uh, we're looking at the question of space and I think the internet as a space has been one of the most fascinating enablers. Uh, but we cannot look at the question of space without the question of identity, cultures, and the very architecture of space, for me to keep coming back to that space is centered around the issue of trust. So um, that was one point that I wanted to throw in the floor. Um, well, Marisha, I, I agree with almost everything that you're saying, but as the chair pointed out, the WTO, which is clearly a pyramidal structure and uh, top down um, and is not in coherence or consonance with the architecture of the internet, um, is something that I would be very worried about because we look at treaties which are binding and mandatory. So at best what we can look at doing when we're looking at sharing intelligence between two countries like India and Pakistan, what would work is probably a bilateral and not um, a forum which is international and intergovernmental largely. Just one last point, um, and I'll promise, I, I promise I'll end at that, is, is the question of uh, space and ownership. And I was deeply disturbed when there were suggestions that like the UK law, Mirava, which would talk about stopping something that is disturbing almost immediately without a fixing responsibility. And that's a thought because you mentioned virtual courts. Aren't we rolling the red carpet for more regulation and more backhand regulation? Wouldn't then we, look, we be looking at a problem which is worse than the solution, possibly? So if one of the panelists could respond to that, thank you. Can you pass the, the mic to the lady in the back? Yeah. Hi, my name is Khadija Ismailova. I'm a journalist from Azerbaijan. And uh, I, would, uh, I would like you to comment more on sovereignty versus uh, resource nationalism issue. Uh, I mean, the countries which has uh, vast oil uh, resources and uh, which uh, my country is one of them, and they insist that they, ha uh, they have to apply sovereignty principles on every issue, including, including the freedom, uh, when they try to limit freedoms. So the messages of sovereignty are normally understood by uh, the governments here like their right to limit versus the global understanding of freedom. Wouldn't be it uh, more, uh, more uh, I would say, um, meaningful to agree on global values uh, of, uh, uh, and global understanding of freedoms and limitations uh, and uh, 
for example, uh, implement and not implement double standards towards countries and uh, to be more strict about its own values. For example, UNESCO wouldn't give with one hand, wouldn't give the prize to dissidents and with other hand name uh, first ladies of dictatorships, uh, uh, goodwill ambassadors. That uh, I think be, we're slightly would, getting off topic here. <laughs> well, that's, that is it because when it, comes to, when it comes to the limitation of freedom, they preach sovereignty. They say we have the, our own understanding of democracy, we have our own values, we have our own culture, so we, ha we understand the freedom and we want to apply to internet as well our own rules. And uh, when it comes, but they also benefit from global, uh, global uh, decorations, global uh, benefits, and so on. Thank you, um, Alejandro. You, Andrea. Whoa. I'll pass it to Andrea. Unfortunately, it's particularly Avhang as well. Uh, okay, I think we are almost. For the moment, I'm closing the uh, the list at the ones that I've I've seen. We'll see if we can go a little bit further. Alejandro, and then thank you, Bertrand. Uh, Alejandro Pisanti. Uh, the I, I have not heard you mention self-regulation explicitly, but I understand it's included in in, in your scheme. Uh, in on the internet, a lot uh, has happened with self-regulation. There are even large economic spaces, like among hackers, for example where there's no real national sovereignty boundary because the goods that are traded are only virtual. I mean, they are trading like lists of credit card numbers uh, versus uh, botnets. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so this, uh, th th this introduces a very interesting dimension in my opinion because some of these spaces are truly commons. And uh, I would like to offer you a dimension that would enrich your analysis or our analysis as we go on. Eleanor Ostrom, in Understanding Institutional Diversity, makes a classification of systems where self-regulation or external uh, hetero-regulation uh, are more significant. This depends on whether e either of them is strong or weak, e that is, obeyed or not obeyed. Uh, when you have no external rule, communities end up self-regulating. Uh, when you have a very strong self-regulation, you don't really need a lot of hetero-regulation. So you can make four quadrants, and the real bad one is where neither external rule nor self-rule, self-regulation operate. You can see that very much in traffic in many cities. Uh, I've seen one coming here, and I live in one, uh, where contention for resources is not determined either by obedience to the law or by good agreements among people to share this common space. You can find some spaces like that in some, so each of the four quadrants in, uh, on the internet. And the, the bad ones are an invitation for sovereignty or for intergovernmental action at the, at the global level, and that could be a dimension to study. Thank you. While the mic goes to this, uh, while the mic goes to this gentleman, no, no. Um, just to insist on how much Elinor Ostrom's work is uh, relevant to many of those. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Margiano, Indonesia Online Advocacy. I'm f very interested with the concept of common space. Uh, however, I'm deep concerned about the tragedy of common concept also, because in the place like in the wild world where there is a common resource shared among animals, the, the tragedy comes because the resource will be monopolized by the strong uh, animals and the weak animals will die. So, in the common space of the internet, we know that there are also quote unquote strong animals, the companies or the organization that control the infrastructure, the control the internet, and they will have greater access to the common resource, and the individual user are weak animals and maybe will die. Will uh, they will not have access to this common space. Thank you. <coughs> I, will, I will allow, if the, the people in the audience uh, allow me, Erika Mann has to leave uh, to, catch, uh, to catch a plane. So 
I will allow her to make a, a, a brief statement, a brief comment before she leaves, and I resume the, uh, the comments uh, around. Yeah, just a very short one. Uh, when we use this analogy of common space the way I used it, there are, it's a reference to already existing international laws. So just to frame the debates, because I think sometimes we try to invent everything new um, because we talk about the internet and it's such a new, um, still for us to some degree, new medium. Uh, and I think it's good to look into existing um, you know, uh, frameworks which already exist and the way you know, we have dealt with it in the past. Uh, maritime, I mean airspace, so many, uh, many other systems, you know them all. I mean, uh, we, when we travel, we constantly cross different you know, boundaries and move constantly between national and between international laws. So when I think uh, the reference which was made by my colleague uh, from Microsoft, I think she is absolutely right um, because we, on, so on one side you have this framework of common law which refers to international existing agreements and on the other side all of our companies work in a different set of applicable laws which are already in place and which are sometimes very diverse by nature. So what we really have to do is to find uh, the different you know, possibilities how we can uh, look for solutions. Maritia mentioned some. Uh, we have on data privacy the safe harbor agreement, for example, between some countries. There are mutual recognition agreements when you touch more on technical issues. I think the most important is really to find ways you know, for agreement between the different levels of um, existing laws and keep the internet open as it is. Actually, taking, uh, taking other spaces, like in particular, not so much maritime law, yeah. but rivers, shared rivers between uh, countries or straits, international passageways is sometimes a bit of an analogy. We will not ex uh, exhaust the topic again, but I just wanted to, to highlight this. I have Andrea Becali. Uh, then I'd like to go to Hang Penwa, then this one, and you. Where's the mic? Over there. Thank you. Yeah, now you can hear me. Thank you for a very good lovely session. It's extremely interesting and, and, and stimulating. I want to just actually following what uh, Eric Amanja said and uh, line up to what Wolfgang mentioned, the, the Westphalia system. I was thinking the Westphalia war ended in 1437, if I'm not wrong, and it was based on a principle called, uh, in Latin, cuius regio, eius religio. In, in my own state, that's my own religion. And the basic sense is, here it's where I have my sovereignty, you don't have to mingle with me. Yes. And uh, it lasted for few centuries, and I'm wondering if nowadays in the internet space we see a new a revival of this principle. If you see that in the all different communities that we see, in Facebook, in Google, in Twitter, in Baidu, in Orkut, you name it, they actually follow in the same principle. <laughs> that's my, that's my <coughs> space, and those are my rules. When you sign up, you actually are, are giving us the consent for for abiding to these rules. So I'm, I'm figuring out maybe the reason why this principle of Cuius Regio, Agius Regio lasted for so many centuries is because it's handy in, uh, in, in preserving power and sovereignty. And uh, linking up to that one, uh, and uh, how do we deal with the limitation of sovereignty? I was thinking about the environment and the Kyoto Protocol. There was a, an example where uh, trying to tackle a global issue where I'm polluting the environment and I'm affecting actually you in the year door. Uh, we need to collaborate and they figure out a system that will work within the best failure framework. So what they did, they did quotas. And, uh, but then what happens is that I don't sign up to the, to, the, to, the, to the agreement and I say, well, let's see. Or I sign up and I don't abide and no one can actually do something to me. Or I sign up and I sell my quotas. That's what happened in the Kyoto Protocol. And he failed. And in, a way, in a way, I think that uh, one of the main reasons why he failed is that he wasn't multi-stakeholder. He was just taking in consideration the same actors abiding to this principle and leaving aside everyone else in this system. So here we go back into a possible solution of the multi-stakeholder model. 
go into the shortcomings of the Westphalia model and just to spread more ideas into that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, can you pass the um, <coughs> hang? Just, just one point, you know, most of you, the book or the articles by Rebecca McKinnon on consent of the govern uh, that deal in particular with the uh, relationship between the users and the platforms in the elaboration of the terms of service. Hang. Oh, sorry. Okay, yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, I'm an academic, I'm an, I'm an academic, so I'll, of course, make things more complicated. Um, just a couple of quick comments. Um, I think I think the work has to be scoped down, because I think, uh, I mean, it's a fantastic uh, uh, work, uh, Bertrand, but I think the work has to be scoped down. I think uh, jurisdiction has to be intentional. So if you have accidental uh, jurisdiction across, uh, you know, it's like pollution crossing, it's a mistake. It's a mistake, things happen. So I don't think we need to, to look at, or we shouldn't look at that too seriously. My second point is that, um, I'm, I wish I had made this remark long ago, but uh, people do not live in cyberspace. And this is a remark from Lawrence Lessig, which means that you regulate, as uh, my, my, my colleague that had mentioned, um, where you are. So uh, governments have some um, sovereignty where you are. Nobody lives in cyberspace. It's when you violate this principle, in fact, that is a problem, that governments try to, to, to regulate and cross jurisdiction where people do not live. So that, that is a problem. I will add also that perhaps we need to look at an issue of inalienable human rights. I'm really uh, shocked at the, uh, the uh, case mentioned uh, earlier uh, by the panelists, uh, Maria, um, that uh, Twitter could even ask for, for details. I think there should be inalienable human rights which cannot be alienated uh, based on human rights, not even by Twitter or Facebook. Thank you. I have, I have two last uh, speakers, please and then you, and then we'll have to close. Go ahead. Oh. I need a mic, a microphone over there. Actually, uh, just to reply on Hang's comment, um, applicability of where people live there's a huge question that is related also to the notion that we explored in another panel, which is, is there something called tr cyber travel when you are in place and you're actually accessing another site in another country? Is this site broadcasting to you or are you virtually traveling to that place? These are the kind of metaphors that have framed the debate. Please. Uh -uh. What about now? Okay. I'm Chinmay. I'm an assistant professor of law from India, and I'm interested in regulatory theory because I feel like it's more constructive than law, particularly in the fields of media and internet, e internet governance. Um, so I wanted to comment a little bit on uh, some of the many things that have been said here that were very useful. One is that we shouldn't be reconfiguring international frameworks where we don't need to. So we do have the UDHR. We do have certain international frameworks which maybe we need to rethink, because what's curious is that while the world is able to come to an agreement about things like the WTO, when economics are involved, we seem to find it harder to come to an agreement where human rights are involved. The UDHR was set up so many years ago. The ICCTR has existed for ages. And we still have countries arguing about um, different political systems, which one would imagine would be negated in some measure by by the ICCTR. Uh, in contrast, you have the, uh, the European Court of Human Rights, the Inter-American Court of Human Rights. So it isn't as though there aren't regional consensus, consensus on occasion on these subjects. So maybe it's worth exploring an international court, court of human rights. I'm sorry if this sounds a little garbled. Um, taking, uh, taking this a little further, I think the, the notion of sovereignty is also tied to this, that this idea that states are sort of sacred boundaries in themselves and other subjects of international law is extremely outdated, and even International Law 101 now tells us that international law sees even citizens as subjects. So that we should cross the boundaries of states in the context of the internet is not actually such a surprise, even within the international law system. Um, and finally, Wint, if you get any time, I would be interested in this one, that when, when, you, when the internet was conceived in the beginning, I would be quite curious about whether you ever imagined that you would be dealing with states that didn't recognize individual rights and only thought of people in terms of communities. 
and how you feel about that technology being available to these political systems. Uh, last, last speaker, Graham, uh, at the end, and we'll close the queue and go to a round of, of comments after remote participation. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Graham Ross, I'm a UK lawyer and mediator, and um, I'm also uh, responsible for the European operation of a company called Modrio, which is specialized in online dispute resolution. I want to, first of all, just quickly, because I know we're running out of time, Bertrand, come to a suggestion, and then perhaps, if we have time, just expand a little bit or, or not. But if I can say... Uh, we have I 10 have minutes until on. the end. That's a no, but I'll be as quick as I can. Um, first of all, we have, by way of extension, what this gentleman was talking about, self-regulation, where we all agree a set of norms and rules. There's also the, the situation of unitary disputes. A lot of people are actually resolving the challenge to their rights, particularly consumer rights, in a consensual way. And that's what online dispute resolution is all about. Now, there's a lot of uh, conversation been going on for over 10 years. Um, 10 years ago, the National Center for Technology and Dispute Resolution in University of Massachusetts formed the um, International Forum of Online Dispute Resolution, which meets every year. Vint, you kindly came and gave a, a fascinating speech to us in Victoria a couple of years ago. Um, next week in Poland, the, there is a, a body, a part of the unit in the University of Wroclaw that um, the center, Research Center for, Techno for, for Legal and Economic Issues of Technology and Communication. And they're having a big conference, uh, I'll be speaking. What I'm suggesting is a bridge between these groups that have been meeting and discussing all these things, um, perhaps bridge into the internet and jurisdiction network. Uh, and I'd be happy to talk to you about that because I think there's a lot that we can all contribute on the issues that, and the commonality of the issues that we've been discussing. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. And as a matter of fact, this is exactly the reason why I wanted to talk longer with you yesterday evening. Uh, alternative dispute resolution and particularly in platform alternative dispute mechanisms may be one of the solutions for instance if platforms like Twitter or Facebook or others establish mechanisms that allow their users to solve issues among themselves a little bit like eBay has done in the past. This is a whole track that I confirm we are indeed exploring and any comment that you are willing to make uh, later on in the process is welcome. Um, we have 10 minutes left and Obviously, uh, we could spend the whole afternoon uh, on this. I'm spending the whole year, so I have no problem. Uh, <laughs> I'd like to go around the table in the other uh, sense, maybe um, starting with, with Vivek. Oh, sorry, I forgot remote participation. We always forgot remote participation. So there is the question from Michael Nelson from uh, Bloomberg Government in Georgetown University in Washington, D.C. Uh, we haven't discussed the national efforts to extend national laws on online copyright to the global internet. Uh, is there any possible solution? That's it. Yes. Could, could you repeat it? Because I was there is the question from Michael Nelson from uh, Bloomberg Government and Georgetown University in Washington, D.C. We haven't discussed the national efforts to extend national laws on online cooperate to the global internet. Is there any possible solution? Okay, go, go, go ahead. I'm sorry. Uh, I apologize. We have a, a little uh, slight glitch here. We want to uh, show um, slides that. What are you? Okay, that, that is a, a, a glitch. <laughs> Vint, you wanted to? There seems to be still trouble understanding. You want to jump in? Uh, well, I think what Michael was saying is, uh, is there uh, any way to extend national law to the Internet, and does anyone want to do that? That's what you understood, anyway. I think I hope he doesn't really want to do that. That would be very counter to the way I think Michael thinks. Maybe he's fearful that someone would try to do that. To project national laws into the internet would be, in effect, to destroy the fundamental uh, thought behind the internet, which is that it is non-national. 
uh, in character in many ways. Uh, I have other comments, but I'd wait until you get around to me. Okay, perfect. Um, Vivek, you wanted to show um, a few uh, images, maps. And, and uh, I want to throw in the, uh, in the pot the notion of cartography that always goes with geography. What are the maps? And obviously, the maps that we're using, which are physical Euclidean maps, whatever the projection we, we use, are very ill adapted to represent what we want. And so I just opened the field for other suggestions. Vivek, you have I a just few. take uh, two, three minutes. So I just yeah. thought of uh, putting this in the beginning. I wish Erika was here because it uh, deals with Facebook in a way. So I was talking about the virtual republic and the real republic, right? So you've got a virtual republic. Let us take the old notion. It's a device that allows people to get together and control their own destiny, much like a nation state, right? Such polities are imagined communities in each person feels a bond with millions of anonymous fellow citizens. In centuries past, people looked up to kings or bishops, but in age of mass literacy and printing vernacular, horizontal ties matter most, and that is the virtual republic's character. Third one is online communities are transcending the limit of conventional states and predicted that members of these communities would find it difficult to stand neutral in this international space. So this is uh, Lawrence Lessig in his code version two. Now let us look at the traditional and the real in a sense. The virtual republic, China, India, Facebook, she says one billion, I don't know the figure. In such case, still it is third, don't worry about it. <laughs> India is still up. And this is the population of a republic. This is the territory, <laughs> the traditional notion of a republic. Virtual republic as a sovereignty, you can see everybody there, you know, with the Facebook, you know, guy, and then you know what he calls consulting world politics, right? So I already recognized diversity, religions from atheist to Zen, languages from Azerbaijan to Zulu, all ethnic colors. But the real republic, I want to come back. Facebook document has been published. It's in NASDAQ, Form 8A. We are entering from the virtual to the real. Governments are real, state is real, economics is real. So my five last slide of five imperatives, which I consider international versus national has not been new. Probably it is a old wine in a new bottle called internet, in my opinion, where that word we have engaged. Time and space interjection of jurisprudence is different in different place. What was uh, in different space and different time will be different in different, when it gets compressed, you really have many tensions culturally. And netizen versus citizen is a doppelganger that you know you try to be a netizen. I don't say a global citizen, you're a netizen, still you're a citizen. And then commerce is loved by everybody and culture is not something uniform, which is not loved by everybody, but each one loves their culture. So that is going to be one of the important space point and globalization versus amelioration, in my opinion, where all you can manage and keep the internet free as much possible is the only solution rather than the word globalization, which is not a a very favorite word to the common man in any space for that matter. Thank you. Thank you. For those who are not familiar, the term Imagine Communities is a remarkable book that describes the birth of the concept of nationalism at the uh, 19th century. I highly recommend it because it's remarkably non-Euro or Americano-centric and it deals with a lot of countries in Asia. Uh, and the other word that emerges from what you said is the notion of cross-border polities. It's a whole debate, but we have to uh, take that into account. Wolfgang, a few words. Yes, I, I want to make just... That's it. Uh, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. Two very... Uh, yeah, two very quick comments. The first to uh, resources and sovereignty. I think the... Um, uh, resources we know from the industrial age has been all limited resources to uh, link to a certain territory and we had a lot of wars to get control over resources in the last century. The beauty of the resources of the information age are that they are unlimited in a certain way and they are not linked to a territory. So that means why to have a war to get control over IP addresses. If you need more IP addresses, 
you, you have enough IP addresses. If you need more domain names, you cre uh, enlarge the, the, the GTLD space and create uh, 1,000 new top-level domains. So I think this is a big difference, um, that the exercise of sovereignty over the resources of the Internet has to be totally different than the exercise of sovereignty over the resources in the real world. I think this is an important point, and you have to understand this. And the second point is, here's my worst-case scenario for the renationalization of the Internet. Every Internet user, uh, according to a your government, passes a national law that every user in the country can get only an um, email address or domain name in its country code space, and he gets a fixed IP address with a password so that he can go with this password to other domains. So uh, it's like your, your, your you know, number on the car. And you, with this number, uh, somebody will, will oversee you, like the police. If you are speeding or wrong parking, then you get a fine. And if you're too, too much speeding, then you, know, you will get no password the next year because you have to renew the password every year. And then somebody, if you go to the state authority and say, I have to renew my password, then they say, okay, we have here a list, you know, with wrongdoing in the street, so you have to wait for, uh, for a year. This is a real option. And this is a real risk and a danger. And this will destroy the Internet as we know it today. I, saw that in another, uh, I said this in another conference. When Gutenberg in, invented the printing press, this was a technology of freedom. There was 50 years of full freedom. And then, you know, some power centers, including the Catholic Church, said it's good to print the Bible, but it's bad to criticize the Catholic Church. And so they introduced a system of censorship, a decentralized system of censorship. You could print a book only with the permission of a bishop. And you had hundreds of bishops, so it was a decentralized system of censorship. And we should be very careful not to bring the ISPs of today in the role of a bishop of the Middle Ages. Wow, <laughs> that's a good analogy. <laughs> Vint. You know, every once in a while I thought maybe the internet should be a monarchy and that it would make it easy. <laughs> but, uh, and you know, guess who would like to, uh, to run that? Um, I just want to make one observation. It's about the fact that the space that we're talking about isn't flat, that there are jurisdictions in the internet that um, overlap in some sense, or they are separate, they're orthogonal from each other, So, and they, they are derived from the lower levels into the higher levels. So I'm struggling a little bit with this, but, but picturing this is, all, is part of the problem. Absolutely. Imagine for a moment that uh, you've got um, the World Wide Web is a kind of underlying platform. But then we put things on top of it, like Google and Facebook and Amazon and so on. And we enter into those spaces. They're not guided uh, or, uh, or managed by the rules of the World Wide Web, except technically. They're managed by whoever is running the application on top of that. And the applications can spawn other applications. It's a little bit uh, like the multiverse and multiple universes. And as you enter into each one of those derived spaces, you may be operating with, uh, with different rules. So the funny thing about all this is that the rules of one of those uh, derived artificial spaces are not the only rules that apply. And the problem is that the other rules yeah. that work their way up are still tied to it. And so somewhere you get down to the point where this little piece of virtual space that you were in is tied to a computer that's in a physical location. Yeah. And so the parties who feel they have jurisdiction at these different layers in, this, in, in the architecture will enter into uh, interaction with you. I'll stop there. Um, Marietje? Thank you. Um, just to follow up on that, because I've also been trying to think about how to picture this. Uh, and the layer uh, metaphor is quite obvious, but besides layers, we also have players. <laughs> um, because the way I've tried to picture this is that <coughs> in order to understand, you know, different uh, scenarios, what you need to do is to take a snapshot, which is more like an x-ray, 
uh, of a situation at a given time. So, for example, if um, you want to know what is the si what are the rights and uh, limitations to the rights of a human rights defender using the internet via um, via um, a Chinese search engine uh, in uh, India, <laughs> then yeah. you can take an X-ray of that and kind of you know add up or uh, look at all the aspects that apply to this player, namely the internet user. Um, but there is also sort of aspects that the different logistical aspects bring along, which is what Vin talked about a little bit more, that there are several technical layers to the internet that each bring along different challenges and implications. Um, so I think what would be a useful exercise is to take a few of these X-ray snapshots uh, and identify which layers of law, jurisdiction, um, interests uh, apply and to see what that means because I think you can you can determine a couple of more likely scenarios and learn a lot from that uh, this is happening on a daily basis I think uh, the rules of uh, cyberspace or or if you want to call it that um, rules applying to people when they go online uh, are currently being being maneuvered and fought out before courts uh, because there is a, an increasing body of case law, but they're also fought out in the market, mm -hmm. uh, and they are fought out in parliaments and other lawmaking bodies where there's a tweaking and a negotiating going on uh, on a permanent basis of, of what is uh, applicable and what isn't. And I, I wanted to say a few more things in relation to the general discussion. Uh, the notion of do no harm or do no harm internationally or whatever, it all sounds very nice, but it also is quite empty because there are real interests at stake here that are very, very serious <laughs> for governments who do, do not want to lose control, for companies who want to gain control and economic benefit, uh, for users that find themselves with uh, increased opportunities uh, and limitations uh, in other cases. So I think it's important to understand that there are real interests at play um, and that we can, on the one hand, use a use this to our advantage, uh, the fact that it is an open space and that there is sometimes an extraterritorial impact. For example, we are happy, let's say, I would, I would hope most of us agree, that because of an extraterritorial impact online, we can get people in a country like Iran to access information, uh, despite attempts of censorship by the government. On the other hand, we are probably not very happy when a business that we run in New Zealand uh, get shut down because somebody in the US uh, is trying to uh, challenge the validity of our business model online. Um, so um, I think that there is a constant negotiation uh, between <laughs> these layers and players online uh, and that there's also several different kinds of law, uh, existing law that, that apply. Uh, but more than anything, and I, th I would like to end on a positive note, uh, I think that despite the fact that there is so little regulation, we, we should, should conclude that things are actually going relatively well uh, without a lot of rules and regulations, and that is something to celebrate. Um, and one of the speakers made a suggestion that we should look more at self-regulation, and I'm not so convinced of that, um, because I think that uh, democratic oversight is very important, and that when it comes to primary uh, tasks like who can police and who can do law enforcement online, we should not be too eager to push those essential responsibilities into the hands of, of companies that uh, are accountable to their shareholders and not necessarily to either users or parliaments or other democratic bodies. So um, let's try not to create too many new laws and regulations. Let's celebrate how well things are going in a relatively unregulated space, but let's study uh, the developments that are going on without forgetting that the interests and the stakes are quite real. Thank you very much. Um, as a conclusion, a very rapid conclusion, I want to um, push even just a bit further what um, Vint was saying about the difficulty to picture this. And not only is it not flat, but for those of you who are familiar with mathematics, it is not an, a non-Euclidean state. It is something that is hyper-networked and that is meshed in a way that is extremely hard to portray. And this sort of jurisdictional sandwich is one of the biggest challenge and one of the tracks that we will certainly explore in the year to come as an outcome of this IGF. Is this connection or not between the layers of the uh, architecture 
and the layers of the jurisdictional competences because there are cases where the competence is exercised because of the location of the user, because of the location of the platform, because of the location of the server, because of the location of the domain uh, operator. The other point I want to, uh, to, to mention is a note of optimism on the non-transboundary harm uh, principle uh, towards Mauritia, which is, you know that in international law, when the behavior of one actor or a certain number of actors is consistently justifiable by the potential application of an implicit principle, this implicit principle progressively gains validity as a reference in the international system. And if you look at what happened in Egypt during the Arab Spring, although the internet was completely blocked on the territory of Egypt, there has been no tampering with the transit traffic that went to irrigate all of Eastern Africa. This means that an, an emerging principle of no tampering with the transit traffic is a potentially very important tool to use in the debate on freedom of expression and free of circulation. Finally, one of the tracks that we have explored and we will explore further is whether the domain name system with its own architecture has some correspondence to the jurisdictional geography. Because if you think again as things that are within facebook.com, as long as you are on the, this domain name, you are on the servers of Facebook and under the terms of service of Facebook. But it is in .com, which means that there is a layer of jurisdiction of the US administration. But if Twitter is accessed through twitter.com or twitter.fr, there is an element of jurisdictional difference. Can we use the domain name system as one of the maps? Maybe it's the roads, maybe it's the mountains, I don't know. But this is a track that we want to explore. We could continue very long. I thank you so much for having come this afternoon after a very long IGF. Please subscribe to the, uh, to the newsletter, get in touch and follow the, um, the, the, um, uh, the mailing list. Send us information, leave your card to um, uh, Paul Fellinger or near the remote participation or when you get out, make sure that we have your card or send me or Paul Fellinger an email. Our addresses are on the brochure. Please communicate and if you organize an event or if you are aware of regional IGFs, national IGFs, national events, thematic events, that would be useful either for us to know about or for us to participate in, this is where we do what we did here, interact with you, and we would have loved to get much more of your input. The internet is there for that. Have a safe travel home, and thank you so much for having come, all of you.